Hi, it's Nathaniel Miner, host of Ghost Train. If this is the first episode of the show you're listening to, I recommend going back and listening to what comes before. This one will make a lot more sense if you do that. Anyway, here's the show. Sam Chesser was a well-traveled kid. He grew up in the Denver suburb of Aurora, but in high school, he went to Kazakhstan and Russia, and in his senior year, New York City. It was super cool. We had no money. <laughs> and so we just went and really uh, stayed. I don't even remember who had the hookup, but somebody knew somebody there. And uh, we slept on somebody's floor. Sam was a nerdy yet popular kind of kid who would go to a strip mall arcade one night and a party the next. And in New York, he and his friends did what you do there. They rode the subway. I remember this as clearly as I remember walking up the hill and seeing St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow and like the onion domes coming in place of like walking down the subway steps and just like all of a sudden you're there and there was a train already just whizzing by. It was just not surreal, but it was just so different than anything I'd ever done before that it was just like, yeah, I, I was just super excited and just ready to go and wanted to ride. New Yorkers may think of the subway as a dirty, crowded part of everyday life. But for Sam Chesser, these trains unlocked the city. It was just like, this is so cool. And like, having seen all the traffic and taxis and cars and stuff. And then all of a sudden you go underground for 20 minutes. And then you come up somewhere else and you're just in a different world almost with how New York is. Sam went home to Denver, and he heard about RTD's big fast tracks plan to build passenger rail lines all over the metro area. And he was pumped. He immediately started thinking about how it could change his life. You know, just becoming 18 and being a lot more likely to be able to just go into the city on my own, um, talking to friends about, you know, instead of hanging around Aurora, we could, you know, hop on the train and just head into town and not have to pay $20 to park or whatever it was that we didn't have. Uh, and so, yeah, it was it was all really exciting. Sam convinced his friends and family to vote for Fast Tracks. And hundreds of thousands of other voters did that too. It passed in November 2004. The vote gave RTD the confidence of people like Sam Chesser. And it gave RTD money, too. Hundreds of millions of dollars every year it could use to start planning and construction to turn dreams into reality. They promised voters more than a half dozen new rail lines in just 12 years. But both RTD and Sam would soon learn that there's a colossal gap between what we want and what we get. From member-supported Colorado Public Radio, this is Ghost Train. I'm Nathaniel Miner. In this episode, how the Fast Tracks plan was nearly just another failure for RTD, before a new leader brought it back from the brink, by single-mindedly obsessing over building things quickly. And we'll take stock of what RTD did build. 18 years and more than $5 billion later, Does Denver's experience show that trains are the best way to unlock a city? Or is Denver still just a car town? After the 2004 vote, Denver area residents wanted information. They wanted to see RTD making progress on these train lines that were supposed to free them from their frustrating commutes. And Jeff Lieb often had the scoop. He was a Denver Post reporter for 25 years. And there was an incredible competition between me and my competitor at the Rocky Mountain News every day to get the real RTD story. He's retired now. He wears wire-framed glasses and has a handsome silvery beard. And as you can tell from his voice, he should have been a public radio reporter. But I digress. So you're at every board meeting? Every board meeting. And I looked at almost every document I could find, it, 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 voluminous documents, uh, you know, everything I could find. And I thought that was my job to kind of be eyes, ears, try to get a whiff of whether there was a scam going on in any sense or whether it was a complete boondoggle. These RTD board meetings are where the public could get a peek at all the work being done to study, design, and start to build fast tracks. 
for the first few years, in 2005 and 2006, it was trench work. These meetings could drag on and on and on. But Lieb says he would stay until the end, because that's when he'd hear about the budget. He covered the construction of Denver's new airport in the 1990s, and he knew that big projects tend to go over budget. So he started working his sources. I would be calling people almost daily, you know, can I find the real numbers? Is there anything in writing that might suggest that the numbers are not as as solid as they were? Then, one day in March 2007, he got a break. You remember where you were when you got it? I do. I met somebody and they and they handed me some documents. He met this person downtown, not far from the offices of both the Denver Post and RTD. And the documents he got, they were leaked. They were a detailed internal analysis of fast tracks. And these documents showed the price tag had gone up by two and a half billion dollars. And I just started looking at the numbers and I said, I think we got a a good story on Fast Track's finances. We knew it was real and we played it out and we let the community know where RTD was struggling. It was important for the community to know. The story took off. With the Fast Track's budget way over the top, RTD officials met today to get a handle on what they might have to do to keep the commuter rail project on track. We are over budget uh, with the plan set up as it is today. However, what we are going to be... RTD executives pushed back on this leak. They said the analysis wasn't finished yet. They didn't want to be seen as incapable of building all these train lines, and they wanted to keep the public support. But RTD's opponents were determined to undermine it. I hate to say we told you so, but but we told you so. The financial model on which Fast Tracks was based was absolutely faulty. John Caldera runs the Independence Institute, a libertarian think tank. He had campaigned against Fast Tracks and now was trying to punch holes in it. Caldera brought RTD CEO Cal Marcella onto his public TV show. And Cal immediately tried to downplay the problem. He said they'd trim costs and look for some private funding to keep things on track. But Caldera did not let Cal off easy. It's going to happen. You're going to be able to pull this off. Yes, we Even are. though you can only pay for about half of what was promised. We're going to manage our deficit and we're going to deliver as promised. And if you don't, what happens? We'll do the best we can, but I'm convinced we're going to deliver on time and on budget. Any guarantees? We've, we've, well, RTD has promised us lots in the past. I'm still looking for and, the rail John, that was promised back and then. And we've delivered. We've got four lines now That's built on time and on budget. That's absolute apples. No, it is not. Then show me the, <laughs> the 93 miles of PRT that was well, promised. That, that pre- didn't happen. That show me the $230 you, million dollar that project. That predated you. That predated me. It so was predicated. now it's all better because... Caldera was whacking RTD over fast tracks but also over all of RTD's missteps over the decades, going way back to the failed rail plans from the 1970s. And remember the Jetsons fantasy of personal transit pods from the last episode? Well, if RTD never built those, Caldera was asking, why should this time be any different? It was not a good moment for RTD and Cal Marcella. And then just a few months later, the whole U.S. economy went into a tailspin, the Great Recession. RTD's finances were in tatters. And through it all, Cal Marcella kept defending his plan. I need to ask this one more way. Yes. You did not lowball the figures at all to get this through. We absolutely did not. We gave reliable estimates. They were vetted through the Denver Regional Council of Governments. We brought in third parties to validate our numbers. No one criticized our estimation techniques when they did it, but also no one saw these cost uh, increases coming on on the horizon. This is a key point. If RTD had lowballed the public, if it had knowingly overpromised, that would be catastrophic for their credibility. A retired mid-level employee who sat in meetings with executives told me that's exactly what RTD did. But every former executive I talked to, and I talked with a lot of them, they denied that. I still wasn't sure either way, so I convinced my bosses at CPR to spend hundreds of dollars to dig up old public records, 
And I got some internal cost estimates from 2003, before the Fast Tracks vote. And those numbers exactly match RTD's public cost estimates. So the best evidence we have suggests that RTD was indeed honest with the voters. Still, this period in early 2007 was the start of a dark time for RTD. It had been more than two years since voters passed fast tracks, and not a single line was under construction yet. One of Cal Marcella's top deputies at RTD, Marla Lean, she says Cal took it hard. I've never seen Cal that sort of down. It really, really took a toll on him. I mean, there were moments when it was like, are we going to be able to get this done? The financing plans, the interest rates, where things really looked like things might not work. People's confidence in RTD started to suffer too. Cal took heat for big raises he doled out to top executives. His own salary swelled to more than $300,000. All this chipped away at the strong support from local leaders that was so important to Fast Track's passing in the first place. Suburban mayors started to fight among themselves over which train should be built first. And they also talked about more oversight for Cal and RTD. The days of Cal being a leader that his peers across the region really believed in, those days were over. Cal felt like the region really turned on him. I think he took it really personally. And it made it hard for him to work with some of those people. You know, every time he walked into a room feeling like he was not trusted, like there was a level of antagonism. And he was somebody that got some good offers. So he left. After 14 years of running RTD, and after selling voters on his vision of trains, Cal was done. He resigned from RTD in July 2009. A new, very different kind of leader was about to take over. That's after a quick break. Hey, it's Nate. I want to take a moment to tell you about another podcast I think you'll love. Purplish is a show about Colorado politics, hosted by some friends and colleagues of mine in the CPR newsroom. Each episode gives you an inside look at what's going on at the Colorado State Capitol. Andy Kenny and Benta Berklin are veteran public affairs reporters who explain the big ideas and the personalities making news at the legislature. Follow Purplish from Colorado Public Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Cal Marcella left RTD in 2009. Projects were stuck, and public confidence was low. A new leader stepped into Cal's void. I won't call it despair, but it was a mood of desperation. It's probably a good word for it. And uncertainty as to what we were going to do as an agency. Phil Washington was hired to take over. He had worked at RTD for nine years already but also spent nearly 25 years in the U.S. Army. And that shaped how he thought about problems. You know, I was a military guy, and that's my background. So I have never really, you know, dwelled on the difficulty of the mission. We focused everybody on the mission at hand, and we developed the discipline to begin this process. So I didn't really think a lot about it. What he was thinking about was motivating his troops, rebuilding excitement and confidence to build out this massive system of trains. I've heard this from many people, but you had a motto at the time. It was like, I think, in the break room up on the wall, and you'd say it at meetings. (laughs) Well, I used to say a whole lot of things, but, um, (laughs) but that motto was build as much as you can, as fast as you can, until it's all done. And that became our sort of rallying cry. Marla Lean says that also came with new expectations for staff. Where Cal inspired his staff to work hard, Phil Washington demanded it. It was a term I was not familiar with, ops tempo, operations tempo. And as he explained it to to us, 
it's that fast pace. You're not shooting the breeze. You're not wasting time. You are getting, you know, you are operating, you are getting it done. And it just meant we were on it all the time. That meant grueling hours. Marla says one day in September, 2010, she counted up all the weekends she'd worked that year. So nine months into the year, there were six weekends I hadn't worked. And I had lost 10 pounds between 2007 and 2010, my doctor told me. And I wasn't really heavy to start with. I weighed less than 100 pounds by then. It was, it was hard. It was just hard. The hard work Marla and others were doing was paying off. They had to make some trade-offs, like shrinking some lines and sometimes only building one track instead of two. But construction was finally picking up speed. And RTD was making progress with its money problems, too. It took out huge loans, more than $3 billion worth, a decision that we'll come back to later. It got a private company to take on some construction and operation costs. And it got a lot of help from the federal government, including a billion-dollar grant. We had a ceremony where the Secretary of Transportation came out with the check, $1.06 billion, and it was a big, big, big deal. The mood of the agency was sky high. I mean, sky high. It was a big deal because it signaled to local leaders and taxpayers that under its new leader, Phil Washington, RTD was back in its groove. By the early 2010s, there were construction zones all over the metro area, downtown at Union Station, out at the airport, through the suburbs to the east, to the west, and to the north. RTD wasn't building everything Fast Tracks promised, the line to Boulder and Longmont was stalled out, but it was getting there. The dream was coming true. Finally, in 2013, the first Fast Tracks line opened. 12 miles from downtown Denver to the western suburbs. And in 2016, the big one, the A-Line to Denver International Airport. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Who is ready to kick off this train? Yes. This was a big moment for Denver. The airport was always hard to reach by transit because it's about 25 miles from downtown. The A-Line would make it there in just 40 minutes. It was predicted to be the busiest train line in the system. A TV news station did its live morning show from the train. People waited for hours for a ride. And I know, because I was one of them. Dignitaries like John Hickenlooper gathered too. And I think it's illuminating to look at 30 years ago, how far we've come, where we're now connecting the downtown with the airport, but also connecting the entire metro area. For Hickenlooper, this was evidence of his consensus-building, collaborative politics in action. We are a place that works together. I think that, looking back 30 years from now, 100 years from now, that's what Colorado is going to be defined by. After years of planning, cutting corners, and financial gymnastics, RTD had done it. Most of it, at least. Between 2013 and 2020, it opened seven rail projects, a rapid bus line between Denver and Boulder, and a newly renovated Union Station. And you remember those empty lots around Union Station? Those were long gone. Shiny new offices and high-rise apartments rose hundreds of feet above. Plazas were full of pedestrians and diners at fancy new restaurants. These lines were opening just as Denver was becoming one of the fastest-growing places in the country. And other cities were taking notice. Los Angeles Metro poached Phil Washington to manage its own big expansion plans. RTD was the toast of the industry and the toast of the city. There have been plenty of stumbles since RTD opened its first Fast Tracks rail line nearly nine years ago. Mechanical and safety issues made some new trains initially unreliable. And of course, RTD didn't build everything. About 25% of the projects are still unfinished, the biggest being the Boulder and Longmont train. And I promise, we'll spend an entire episode on that later. And while RTD was so focused on its new rail lines, it neglected the rest of its system. 
Years before our current pandemic era worker shortage, RTD was chronically short staffed because it underpaid drivers and didn't fix bad working conditions. That made service unreliable. At the same time, fares got very expensive and RTD put off hundreds of millions of dollars in basic maintenance. But RTD's accomplishment, opening so many new train lines in such a short period of time, it's stunning. And I wanted to know, how are they doing? Have they unlocked the city? One big selling point for Fast Tracks is that it would boost transit-oriented development. Think taller buildings within walking distance of a station. All of the new apartments and offices around Union Station are definitely the best example of that in the Denver area. And there are others all over the region. I'm at the Sheridan Station Apartments. It's a big building um, at the corner of Sheridan and Lakewood Gulch. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stories. And I'm going to walk over to the W line stop here. See how long it takes. One, two, three, one, thousand, four, one, thousand, five, five, eighty-six, eighty-seven, eighty-eight, eighty-nine. 90. And here I am. So a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. Not bad. Next train will be here in four minutes. The train station here is about five miles west of downtown Denver. It's mostly surrounded by single family homes that have been here for decades. But closest to the station are new three story row homes and this towering apartment building full of affordable units. And that's where I met Rosemary Chosler and her dog. And who's this down here? This is my puppy, Kasha. She's four months old. It's K-A-S-H-A. Hey, Kasha. Kasha. Kasha, look. Rosemary has lived in Denver for a long time. She's in her 60s now with silvery hair. And she doesn't drive anymore. So she says that having the light rail so close was a big reason she wanted to move here. Why? I can get anywhere. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And I've been in Denver 45 years, and this is huge. The light rail is huge. It's, I still don't know all the ins and outs of how to ride it, but I'm learning it. Yeah. And um, I love it. You can get places so quick. Yeah. yeah. Developments like this are key to making RTD's rail lines successful. More than 30,000 homes, mostly apartments and condos, have been built near RTD's rail stations. Another 12,000 are planned. 11 million square feet of office space has opened near rail stations, too. But some suburbs have resisted allowing dense new developments, and the location of many stations next to highways or in hard-to-reach places means their potential is limited. I met Rosemary last year, and I followed up with her recently to ask if she's used the train as much as she thought she would. No, she said, she hasn't, because she doesn't feel safe at the station. Crime is a growing issue for RTD, especially around Union Station downtown. But Rosemary also pointed out that there was a lot of crime at her last apartment, too, and that wasn't anywhere near a train station. So RTD's rail lines have clearly made an impact on where things are built and how they're built. But what about commuters who haven't moved into one of those new apartments? So, yeah, pack everything else the night before and just have it by the door because I'm notorious for leaving stuff here at home. Remember Sam Chesser? He was the 17-year-old who rode the subway in New York and was so excited to vote for Fast Tracks and to use it. Pick a watch. Well, this transit fanboy is in his 30s now, with a wife, a dog, and a cute little bungalow in northwest Denver. And that should be it. I joined him recently for his morning commute to downtown. We walked out the door and right into his rattly old Ford Focus. Uh, so we're driving to work. Yep. Uh, why? Uh, because I've got a meeting at 9, and I know that if I wanted to take the bus, I probably would have had to have left about half an hour, 45 minutes ago, to deal with uh, 
it being almost certainly late to picking me up and then uh, being a little bit slower than advertised on the way in too. Sam's bus only comes every 30 minutes and it's stuck in the same traffic as everyone else. RTD hasn't invested much in its bus system in decades, and it even plans to cut into it to help pay those massive loans it took out to build the trains. That could happen in the next five years. And the the G line, the commuter rail line, is not too far from here. Um, Cause that, have you ever taken that? Yeah, um, again, with, with the schedule that it has and with where I actually have to go, I have to drive away from the city pretty much to get on my closest stop. Um, it ends up not saving me really anything unless like traffic is ludicrously bad. RTD said fast tracks would improve traffic by converting some drivers to train riders. But most of these trains have struggled to attract passengers, even before the pandemic. Only the line to the airport has gotten close to meeting its original ridership goals. And one reason for low ridership goes back to those trade-offs RTD made to get the lines built. You can really see it in places where RTD only built one track to save money. That means trains can never run as often as originally intended. And in some cases, RTD was forced to make their lines less useful. Like a hospital campus that made RTD move a station farther away from it to protect its sensitive medical equipment from vibrations and electromagnetic interference. The trains are good at getting suburban commuters into downtown, but they're much harder to use for riders who work out in the suburbs, simply because it's so hard to walk through suburbs. Denver's continued growth has made traffic worse than ever. The trains may be able to help that, if downtown can bounce back, and if more people can get to the stations. And you are, you're in the city of Denver, you're on the northwest side, yep. sort of a neighborhood from probably the 1950s or yep, so. Yep, exactly. Um, so we're not too far out. Um, but the closest train station is, uh, what, a couple miles away? Yep, so yep about two, not, two or 2.4 or something like that, yeah. Not really walkable. No, no. I've, I've thought about it. I've thought about riding my bike and the bike corridor up there. I mean, I'd have to get on Pecos, <laughs> like North Pecos, and that's, that's terrifying. Um, and then the other closest one would be Fox Street, but by then I'm about a mile from work. Um, and so it's, it's really a bunch of sacrifices, and I, I really thought about it a lot to try and make it work, and I just got to the point of, you know, I'm, I'm jumping through all these hoops to make my commute significantly worse, and I'm not getting the actual benefits out of public transportation personally, as a city, or as a world. What does that feel like? Like, compare that to your expectations of 2004? Uh, it, it's super disappointing, and it's hard not to be jaded by it, and just, uh, you know, look at what what could be in any city and know that, you know, we don't have anything close to it. Sam Chesser says his dreams from 2004 were definitely a little naive. He thinks back to the lines on the Fast Tracks map he saw as a teenager stretching out all over the whole region, and in his head, he saw those going to places he actually wanted to be. Now, he realizes they were never designed to do that, because most of the stations are park and rides in the suburbs. They've been all but deserted since the pandemic, just like RTD's rail cars, each their own kind of ghost train. Do you ever use it? Uh, I'd say about twice a year. Um, we've got friends around Arvada, and so we've talked about that, and then it still ends up being, let's, let's just drive, because by the time we spend the money to actually get up there, especially if there's two of us, all of a sudden it's $12 round trip and you can park for free in a lot of downtown Arvada. And like, it, it's, it's just, it's hard to, to make that trade off. Um, and you know, maybe that makes me not as big a supporter of public transportation as uh, others, but uh, I, I, I want to use it. It's just so much less convenient and the cost is just, I mean, not there for me to have it make sense for those types of things. Right. Across the entire city and suburbs, I think there are a lot of people like Sam Chesser. People who want to take transit, but can't quite make it work. RTD's overall ridership was just barely higher in 2019 than it was in 2008. And the Denver region grew by half a million people in that time. RTD is hoping people will get back on board if and when the pandemic ends.
I guess the other thing you can do is just like sell your house and move to an apartment next to a rail station if you really were hardcore. If I wanted to get divorced, I think that would work well, but <laughs> <laughs> I definitely had uh, dreams of that at one point in my life, but uh, that's, that's not there. <laughs> we cruise into downtown Denver. Sam flips a blinker on to pull into his parking garage. And for a few seconds, we have to wait for another car in front of us. We idle over a light rail track just as a train is arriving. Kind of ironic. Yep. <laughs> Denver has come a long way since that second place Super Bowl finish in the 1980s. But for Sam Chesser and other would-be commuters, it's not yet a world-class city. At the same time, it's also true that a lot more people want to live here these days. And RTD should get some credit for that, for helping revive downtown Denver, at least before the pandemic. Still, it's becoming clear that there are real limits to Fast Track's impact on how we get around the city. Because RTD went out of its way, quite literally, not to disturb streets dominated by cars. Why did it have to be this way? Rail lines cost billions of dollars and only come along every generation. So why didn't RTD put them in more accessible places? And what can be done to move people more efficiently in those places now? If we really want to see a better city, a better world, one that really prioritizes climate change, right? Really prioritizes the impacts on our city, we have to change. next time on Ghost Train. Hey, it's Nate. If you're enjoying Ghost Train, I have a quick favor to ask. Take a moment to find Ghost Train on whatever podcast app you use and give us a like, a rating, or a review. If you think the stories we're sharing are important, if you think reporting about accountability matters, all you have to do to spread the word is like us, rate us, or review us. It really does help other people find this podcast. Thanks for listening, and thanks for supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio.